everyone. Welcome to Achieving Success with Olivia Akin. I'm your host, Olivia Akin. Each week, we will discuss the roadmap of achieving your personal and professional success. We will give you real life stories on growing personally and professionally to achieve your life and career goals with the help of some top notch guests. Today, we are speaking with Brandon Puffer. Brandon played professional baseball for the Houston Astros, San Diego Padres, and San Francisco Giants. After playing professional baseball, Brandon ended up spending four years in prison. After being incarcerated, Brandon found his way back to his passion and co-founded the company GPS Texas Baseball. GPS Texas Baseball not only creates a competitive baseball environment, but also teaches young men how to play the game the right way by building character. Brandon has also published the book From the Bullpen to the State Pen. You can find Brandon by going to his website, coachpufferpositive.com, or by emailing him at bpuffer at gpstexasbaseball.com. Hello, Brandon. It's fantastic having you on the show today. Yeah. Hey, Olivia. It's great to be here. Real quick, it's coachpufferpositive.com, not puffer. But that's good. We're all good. I'm thrilled (laughs) to be here with you, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you for being on. I'm super excited to get this going from the moment we talked. I mean, my favorite thing, to be honest, is even your book name from the (laughs) bullpen to the state pen. So we'll definitely get into that. But to start off the show, can you tell me what success means and looks like Brandon Puffer? Yes, absolutely. You know, and and, and my uh, opinion or my definition of success has shifted over time. And at this point, I really feel like it's being the absolute best version of yourself every single day, right? Because we're so focused on others and their success and what they're doing, and it can easily tie you up. So for me now, it's just like every day I wake up, I believe there's a purpose for my life, and I just want to be the best version of me in every aspect of my life on that given day. Whatever I've got that day, I want to be 100% in. And I love that answer. And so let's kind of dive into the different aspects, like you said, at different points of your life, there was different success moments. So can you, you get started in baseball, your ba- your professional baseball career, because mind you, you played baseball your whole life, basically, mm-hmm. but you got started in your baseball career right out of high school. What was it like starting to play in the major league right after high school? Yeah, so Olivia, the day I graduated high school in California, I took a plane flight across the country to Florida to start my baseball career. And baseball is a little different than, say, football, where there's a lot of minor league stops along the way. So you're not thrust straight into like that big league environment in most cases. I I wasn't. I went off to rookie ball, but it was still just shell shock, like seeing the amount of talent and gifts that everybody had. You were all kind of our the best in our little area. And now it's like, okay, everybody's really good. What's going to separate me? And not only that, but just emotionally and mentally, I was nowhere near prepared. So I had all this freedom and with a bunch of other guys that have all this freedom and we think we're kind of cool because we're pro baseball players now. And so it was a rude awakening. And to be honest with you, especially my downtime, like off the field and stuff, I just didn't handle it very well. But in terms of the baseball stuff, just being around the best in the world, it really pushed me and it was just a, a great experience all the way around. And I want to go into that a little bit more because for you, as you said, it pushed you in the baseball sense, but it was quite an adjustment having that freedom. And a lot of men and women go through that, especially when they go off to college, you know, that transition from, you know, kind of being at home, having adults look after you, help you make that right decision. And for you, it was brought to another level. Not only are you now away from your family and being able to have that freedom, but eyes are on you, right? So sometimes when you go to college and you're not an athlete of a big program or you're not literally a professional athlete, um, when you go to college, you can make those decisions and make those choices, good or bad, Mm -hmm. and it gives you that freedom to do so and learn from them, but it doesn't have the added pressure of everyone's watching your every move and seeing what you're doing for you. What was that like having that freedom, having to kind of, you know, adjust to it and learn while having that pressure of being in the spotlight? 
Yeah, it was tough. I, I felt like a fish out of water. I mean, it was exciting. I mean, I was super excited. I, I lived in a pretty structured home. Um, my mom was a pastor and all these things. So it was like, oh my gosh, all this freedom, right? And um, but at the same time, I, I you know, I was taught what was right from wrong. Um, my dad had, had suffered with addiction in his life. So I, I knew kind of the perils and the dangers of that, but I had my own choices to make. And ultimately I chose so that I wanted to have fun because I'm, I'm air quoting because it can be fun to go out and have nightlife and stuff. But at the same time, I was a guy that didn't really have an off switch. So some guys were just great at handling it. Either they didn't do it or they were mature enough to, you know, do, do it for a little bit, have a drink or two, go relax and go home. And I just always kind of took it to another level. And so I just kept learning the hard way um, that it just wasn't for me. I didn't handle it well. I was kind of, I'm an all in all out guy. And that was great on the field, but off the field, it was, it was a detriment for me. And so, especially at that time where, like you said, I'm 18 across the country, uh, nobody kind of watching me. Thank God we didn't have cell phones and everything was videoed back then or else who knows. But um, so it was just this learning curve of trying to manage my time, be committed to my profession because ultimately we were professionals. We just weren't really acting like it all the time. And so a lot of uh, tough lessons and a huge learning curve, I would say, for the first several years of my minor league career all through A-ball and you kind of mature along the way and figure some stuff out, but it, it took me a little longer than some. So when you transitioned into the MLB, you ended up playing for multiple different teams, as we listed in the beginning. How was it like playing for different teams and transitioning for them while trying to find your place within the community? Yeah, it was... Um... It was it was okay. It was tough, uh, and that's kind of the, the the new age baseball. I never had that that long contract where I could really settle in and like this is going to be home for a while. Um, I played 15 years, and I was literally on one year contracts every single year. So the nice part is, you know, and, and I can only speak to baseball, but it's kind of like the same cast of characters, just different locker room, different uniforms, and so you go and you kind of find your niche and who you like to hang out with and and your routine. And I think that's the important part, right? Is like the uniform changes, the organization changes. Um, I think I was ultimately in like 12 organizations, but at the end of the day, you've got to find your routine. You've got to take things from every different coach and every different organization and implement it and what works for you because they're all a little different. And so you guess you have to be respectful to whatever team you're with and organization. But at some point you realize like, I've got to take control of this career and I've got to figure out what works for me. And the beauty of that is you can take that from so many different um coaches and mentors and kind of mesh it into one thing that that works for you. And what I think it, a very important aspect of what you just brought up is you when you have so many different people that are surrounding you and so many different tools they might be using it is an opportunity it ends up being an opportunity to be able to take what they're using and what works for you as you had said to build what you want in your toolbox and what works for you because everyone learns and everyone trains a different way. So not everything's going to work the same, but you can take the best and take it in your case to a different organization or a different role. Just yeah. because you're doing something within one position doesn't mean that even if it's different in the next role, you can't take some of those lessons and those tools. Like you had said, you had only yearly contracts for the most part. It's at, and like you also said, it's vastly different now. You know, when we turn on ESPN and it's time for the MLB contracts to start being renewed, you're seeing three-year deals. You're seeing all different types of things. For you, what was the feeling like every season knowing you're only playing that season and nothing else is guaranteed after that? You know, it was exciting to, to an extent. I mean, obviously, we would all want to get that sense of um, security and, and things of that nature, especially as you have family and kids and they're in school. But at the end of the day, it was exciting because you were always playing for something and you always should be anyway. But at the end of the day, when you're motivated and, and you have a really good season and now you're able to kind of be a free agent and, and look at some options, it's that's an exciting time. You know, there's a few times where you have kind of an average season and you're you're reeling a little bit like, uh oh, I need to find a job, you know, just get me a job somewhere. Um, but when it was a good season and when things were going well, it was fun because you get a few teams involved. And especially it was a blessing in disguise for me 
because I got released after my second year of rookie ball. And typically an organization will have rights to you for like six years and you make the bare minimum all the time. And, and in the minor leagues, it's not much. And so after I got released, it ended up being a blessing in disguise because I'd have a good season. I would end up making decent minor league money just by a little bit of negotiation and stuff like that. So I enjoyed it. It was all I knew. I mean, absolutely. I would have loved to have a good season and get locked up for a few years um, in terms of a, a good contract and settle in because I did always pitch with a high level of anxiety of, um, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to be really good or I'm going to be out of here. And, and so I feel like, you know, if you get that good contract and you can relax just a little bit enough to go out and compete without that pressure, maybe that would have helped me at the big league level, but it's the only thing I knew. And I just competed for a job every year. Brandon, towards the end of your career, there were choices you made that ended up changing the whole projection and outlook of your life. It actually ended up leading you to prison and the book you ended up just writing, which again, my favorite name, and I've been saying it nonstop, the yeah. bullpen to the state pen. I think that's mm-hmm. so clever. But can you give us some insight into what occurred that night and how the small choices you made along the way that didn't seem that big in the moment ended up leading you to a few years in prison. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, It's a huge part of my story and I'm always very uh, transparent and vulnerable about it in hopes of helping others, encourage others. And those who think, man, this could never happen to me. Right. And I was in that same boat. Um, I alluded to having, you know, some addictive personalities early on, um, you know, when it comes to alcoholism and things of that nature. And my dad went through the same thing and, got to watch him become sober in high school and, and kind of watch that from afar. Like, Hey, this can be done. You can change your life, but ultimately we've got to make our own choices. And so what seemed like just one bad night, one compromise, which it was, I went out with the guys to celebrate a championship. We were in landing myself in jail the next day. Um, I, I blacked out, um, barely remember the evening, which is no excuse for what I did. Absolutely. I, I own that hundred percent. But it was when you when you go and I did have that time in prison to really peel back the layers of what made me think this was OK, regardless of drinking or being overserved or like what was going on inside of me that made this you know happen. And ultimately, what I found is there were some childhood traumas that I went through that a lot of people go through, you know, sexual assault being one of them. And and I didn't ever kind of want to talk about that. No, who wants to talk about that? Right. But um, I was numbing a lot of things from my childhood that I didn't deal with. And then I was compromising. And I was knowing all along that, hey, the lifestyle for me, no judgment on anyone else is not to go out and drink and party and chase women, do all these things that I thought made me a man that I was trying to fulfill some emptiness inside of me. I knew it wasn't right. Like I said, I was raised right. But at that one particular night on September 13th, 2008, that you spoke about, I had been on a good path. I had gotten myself sober for a while. And I just said, you know what? You know what? What's one night with the guys, right? We're going to go have some fun just one night and ultimately landed me in prison. And like you said, for four years, and I had to really relearn a lot cognitively once I went in there. And it wasn't just like, okay, I messed up. Let's just serve my time out and figure it It was like, no, you got yourself here over a series of choices and over a series of, you know, uh, wrong thinking, and you got to replace these thoughts and you got to really rewire this whole thing to get any better. So fortunately um, I did that while I was in there with the help of, you know, a lot of support system and teams and, Um, I just uh, was very intentional about how I did my time and came out on the other side of that, you know, better man. I needed humility in my life and some other aspects that were missing that, um, you know, that time provided for me and kind of set me up for the next phase of what I call kind of the redemptive side of my story. And what I think is important for anyone to understand as well is having that time to take accountability and really look back and reflect is always important, no matter what's going on in your life, as well as the fact that sometimes you need those kind of, and we've discussed this before, those small bad choices in the moment that you necessarily wouldn't think are bad. Like you said, you knew inside that you were compromising. You knew inside that your decisions were compromising because you were with people, you trusted them. You felt like, oh, this is okay. Like, yeah, I'll do it. I don't necessarily want to do it. And let's be honest, we've all been there where you're sitting there going, okay, do I think this is necessarily 100% right? No. Is everyone doing it? Is it that bad? No. Okay, I'll do it. 
right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether that outcome, you look back and go, I could have just said no and moved on. Um, right. Or it's one of those moments that takes a long time to get there yeah. really depends. One thing before we dive more into your story that I think is amazing that you brought up was that sexual assault from earlier. You know, there's a lot of victims out there who don't necessarily have the voice or feel comfortable bringing that up when it happens or even their whole life. So for you, what made you decide that you were comfortable talking about that and going through the motions? And what would you give to other victims? What advice? Ultimately, it took, um, like I said, that time away when I was uh, in prison and I was really kind of retooling my thoughts and really taking a deep dive. So everything up until that point, Olivia, had just been, you know, just focused on my career and achievement and just go, 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 go. I don't have any time to worry about these little flaws that are, you know, yeah, I got some flaws. We all do. But hey, I'm just going right. And so ultimately, when something like that happened to me, and like you said, no one would expect that. Um, I have buddies go, you were the last person I thought went in up there. And I'm like, well, thank you. I think that's a compliment. But yeah, this is why I share my story, because that can happen to literally anybody. And um, ultimately, what happened is, in a little more detail about that night, um, I, I lived kind of a promiscuous life. And I just didn't didn't really like have respect for the gift of, of you know sex and all those things. And so I, I was like, something isn't right. You know, I, I don't really handle this the right way. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was like, oh, I'm just playing ball. I'm just a guy, you know, whatever. And it's like, no, that's not that's not OK. That's not an excuse. And it's not what a man is. And so um, as I look further along, that was something I had really bottled up for a long time. And I just said I, I opened up to a few people and I just said, hey, I don't know. This could have something to do. I didn't want to use an excuse, certainly. But everyone I talked to was like, hey. If you know the stats, you're not alone, not even close. And I was like, okay, well, that makes me feel better. And and B, absolutely, if you don't go heal that, that little Brandon that went through those traumas, it's going to show up in your life over and over. And I, and I saw those patterns. And so I was like, you know what? Some people gave me a voice and made me feel like I wasn't alone, whether it be on the, on the sexual abuse aspect or the mental health aspect or whatever the case may be. I said, you know what? That empowered me. So I'm just going to keep talking about it too and hopefully empower others to go, look, man, maybe I need to go back and look at that before I can really, you know, heal and move forward and truly love myself and do all these things. And I found a lot of healing in that. So that's why I'm pretty open and public about it is to hopefully encourage others to go, look, you know, take a look at that. Don't be afraid. Don't keep bottling that up and stuffing it down because it, it could affect you until you actually open it up and, 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 and it loses a little power when you start getting it out in the open. And I love that. It loses power when you speak about something. Yeah. And it really does. I think there's kind of like you said earlier in the beginning of telling that journey is, you know, you didn't think it was, a, you know, the stats were what they were in sexual assault and everything like that. But because it's not talked about like that. And so when you put it more in the open, you understand that there are those people that have been through it and it is people you don't necessarily always suspect would be victims because they don't put on the face or they put on a face that everything yeah. is okay right yeah. and you we all go through life and sometimes when things are tough we don't let everyone see that we're going through things or things can be difficult in our everyday lives and social media has definitely helped with that, right? The, sure. We're going to put our business out there, but you don't <laughs> put all of your business out there. You yeah. put the great moments, right? We're most, yeah. more likely going to put those good moments out there. But when you actually say, no, this is what's happening. You're asking me how my day is. You're asking me what's going on in my life. Here's the true answer behind that. You'll understand that people are a lot more likely to stand not behind you, but with you in mm -hmm. saying, I have you, I'll support you. I've been there. Let's talk about it. And it then puts less weight on, you know, the power those words have, the power that has and is able to allow you to grow as an individual as well. Oh, I agree 100%. That's really well said. And just to back up a tad, one of my biggest downfalls prior to uh, me getting arrested 
was not wanting to talk about my struggles, not wanting anybody to know that I was having a hard time because at that point I was deep into my career. I was in a role where I was kind of a player coach mentor for some young guys. And uh, the last thing I wanted them to know is that I was messed up. And so when they would ask me questions like, let's go out, let's do this. Instead of telling them guys, I can't do that. Like I would just say, no, no, no. And I'd go out on the side by myself, right? I live this double standard. And I think had I had the ability to go, look, guys, I'm not who you think I, you think I have it going on because I'm an FCA leader on the team and faith is important in my life. It is, but I'm screwed up right? and I'm struggling. And at night when we have all this free time, my mind's going a million minutes, you know, a million miles a minute. And I don't know how to react to that. So I go and do whatever I do and drink or numb or whatever. And I think everyone, like you said, is willing to come alongside and bring help to that situation. Once you raise your hand and go, I'm struggling. And then everyone's like, Hey, I've been through that. Hey, me too. And now you kind of strengthen numbers, iron sharpens iron. For you, while you were in prison, as you had mm-hmm. said earlier, you had a lot of time to reflect and regroup. What were some of the things that while you were in prison, you learned, not necessarily, you talked about some of it already, but about yourself, but also what you then could take from your experiences within prison that you could yeah. only have within prison and yeah. take that after you left. Yeah, I think one of the big ones that jumps out is just how resilient we really can be when put in a situation that we wouldn't expect we could get through, right? If you were to ask me like, hey, could you go do three, four years? And no way, heck no. And then you get thrown in there and you're like, okay, you got to survive one day at a time, right? And I also realized, and this is amazing, this is one of the biggest things for me, that true joy, true peace inside your heart can't be taken away from you regardless of circumstances. Um, to that point, I, I knew what happiness was and happiness was I'm pitching good. Uh, we're winning. Uh, my family's going good. We're not arguing, whatever. I'm happy. I'm happy. And then those things get taken away and it's like, well, now what? I, I'm not happy, but peace and joy is what, which I actually found in that dark place, um, by kind of surrendering my whole life and going, Hey God, I put myself, this is where my choices got me. I'm open. like, whatever you got for me from here forward, I'm open. And then all of a sudden this peace and joy not like after, like, hey, after this four years, then I'm going to start. It's like, no, right now in the depths of this thing. And, you know, obviously I saw a lot of things, a lot of things went on. And, you know, I think one of the hardest part is, is just not communicating with your family very often and missing your loved ones. And so you really got to dig deep and find out, like, where does my strength come from? How do I find joy and peace in a time like this? And, and I found that. And so it was just like, wow. So now moving after that, you come out and you just humbly start life over and go, hey, I don't know. I have peace and joy in there. Surely I can find it out here. And then um, what I have found is when you take that mindset and you're not just like, oh, poor me, I just got out of this. I've got this X on my back now. It's like, no, I own this. I put myself through this. I have humility in my life now. I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to, to you know, work my way back into being a trustworthy person and being someone of value to this world. And um, all of a sudden, it just little by little, things get bestowed upon you that um, that show up in your life like that. And, and here we are fast forwarding with everything's been redeemed to me, my kids, my family, I have a great wife, uh, baseball's back in my life with what you already mentioned with the program I run. And it's just like, could have never guessed that when I was sitting there in prison. I never thought these things would be after that. I was like, where does life go after this? And that's why I really open up and talk about it all. Cause I'm like, same thing can happen for everybody else going through that. Exactly. And I think it's so important to understand that anyone can end up in any situation. You're never above a situation. You have to be able to have compassion and say, why might that be going on? What are the reasons? And you don't always know, right? As an outsider, as a friend of someone, whatever the situation, family member, whatever the situation might be, don't fully judge someone based off what you think you know. Try to understand the story and get the information, right? We're all allowed to have our opinions and our judgments and whatever it might be, but don't make it from a surface level data, as one might say, go to that person, have those conversations, try to understand. And when you have those in-depth vulnerable conversations, you're able to then relate and kind of see things from perspectives you might have not been able to see. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. Absolutely. And I definitely dove in and got to know a lot of folks when I was in there, guys that you wouldn't try to get to know probably on the outside and realize just what you said, that there's some very talented, gifted, intelligent men that love their family that made poor choices. And some of them 
that poor choice led to where they may not even ever get out. And so it's like so sad to think about. And then when you get a second chance at life, you're like, man, I got to make the most of this because it almost all got taken away. Brandon, for you, you got out of being in prison. You started finding your way back to your passion, which we'll discuss in a minute. But I want to touch upon your book um, from the bullpen to the state pen. I cannot say that enough. (laughs) Um, It's going to be my favorite saying. But how did you know when the right time was to write this book and put it out there? Um, You know, I I didn't know, honestly. And what had happened was I, I kept a journal all through my time there. And I thought that was valuable information and thoughts and feelings that I was, that were occurring going through that hard time. And then I had several people going, Hey, you've got a powerful story. You know, you you should write a book. And I thought, okay, I don't know anything. You know, if I need to come up with a throwing program or workout program, I got you, but writing a book, I don't know. So I I would get these little pieces of advice, like write one chapter a day, write one page. So I would do that, pick it up, put it down. And honestly, Olivia, that went on for like 10 years. And I got to the point where I was like, I'm not a guy that wants to just keep talking about something and not doing it. Mm I was like, look, it's either time to do this or quit talking about it. And right around that time, I was praying about it. And I was like, what's the right thing to do here? Do I need a ghostwriter? Do I need, what do I need? And a mutual friend of mine took, took some time to have a phone call with me. He had written a couple books and done well. And he said, you know, he gave me all this advice. And then he just finally asked the question that no one else had asked. He's like, what do you need? And I go, honestly, I need someone to hold my hand through the whole thing. Literally, that's what I need, I think. The next day, he's at an event and he meets these guys um, just random meeting, uh, Alex and Will, who own this streamline company. And that's what they do. They interview you, they get your story down, they hold you accountable. They, they help you make the chapters with your information. And I just had this phone call or zoom, like we were doing. And I said, this is it. It's time. And from the time I, you know, got together with them and, and went into contract with them and we started this process, that's what I needed was the accountability and the know-how. I think within a year we were published and it was out. And with that, I'll be honest without them, I don't know if I would have done it. Uh, or I know I wouldn't have done it for this quality. They did an awesome job of helping and just kind of getting the story out there. So that's all it was. I think God had the right timing the whole time. I just kept trying and pushing and nothing happened. And then when I met with these guys, it all just took off. For you, as you said, there's a lot of lessons you learned along the way that you wanted to tell other people about and help others with. What do you hope the book brings to other individuals who pick it up who might be? you know, playing baseball as young men, playing softball as young women, be in any sport or not in a sport at all? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. I, I think I'm trying to talk to a couple of different groups of people. One being the, the person that is, you know, prior to my mistake, right? The Brandon whose dad was telling him, hey, you don't want to go down that path. Hey, you, you know, this this is ending in trouble. We kind of see these warning signs and just try to get a hold of that one person that goes, like I did. Oh, I'm going to find out for myself. You know, I'm going to, this was an expensive, expensive lesson for me. And it can be a cheap lesson for somebody else to go, man, I don't, I might be heading down that. That seems a little extreme, but I'm, I'm just going to be played on the safe side and I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to go do that thing. Or the other one is the person that's made the big mistake, right? Maybe they didn't go to prison. Maybe they did. And they just have all that guilt and shame and they can't move forward in their life because they're just carrying this heavy sack of all this guilt and shame. And I'm here to go, look, I get that. I feel that. I just have to shift my thoughts and I have to, you know, be intentional about positivity and what I listen to and what I read and what I do. And there is life after that. You don't have to carry this. Nothing is more shameful to me than what I did. I mean, it's embarrassing as all get out. It's horrible. I let so many people down. It was just awful. And I'm just saying that because it's real. But then it's like, hey, okay. It happened. Now what I need to do. And so the big thing about that is too, uh, I think Olivia is just the postures that need to take place. It's not like I just went and did my time and came out the same old cocky baseball player. Like, yeah, cool. I went to prison now. What's up? It was like humility, change your behavior, um, be intentional every day about your routine. Um, And I always kind of allude to the steroid scandal in baseball. I don't know how much you remember this. I think you're a little young, but it was like, it came out and the guys who just owned it, they're just like, I made a mistake. I tried to get an edge. It was the wrong thing to do. I, I let down a lot of people. There was forgiveness there. The guys who just continued to hang on and go, no, 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 not me. No, no, no. Those guys are still paying for that in some ways, right? And so it was a good lesson in 
we make mistakes. Just own them and move forward. And here's some of the behaviors that help that. So I think those are the people I'm trying to target and encourage. And I love that. And I think what you said about everyone makes mistakes, own your mistakes and move forward. Come up with a plan to grow from that mistake and take the lessons from it and improve yourself or keep. Brandon, when you got out of prison, you were trying to find your way back to your passion and figuring out what that would look like. What was that journey like for you? It was interesting, actually. I um, I, I didn't think, I, I didn't know, but I, I didn't think baseball would be a part of my life again. I wasn't sure. To be honest with you, I had some thoughts of like, I messed up too bad. You know, the shame we just talked about. The enemy working on my mind of like, no, nah, you don't, you had a great gift and you don't belong, whatever. But how it happened was, and I go back to humility and, and being able to take small steps is uh, we have a AAA ballpark here where I live in Round Rock, Texas. And uh, the president, uh, Reed Ryan, son of Hall of Famer, Nolan Ryan was a buddy of mine. He encouraged me throughout my time in prison. And he said, Hey, look us up when you get out and let us know what you need. And I said, man, I really need a job. And it's hard because I have a, you know, I'm a convicted felon now and I have these X's on my back. And he said, okay, well, come to the stadium. And him and his brother Reese were running the team. And they said, well, we don't have much, but we have a maintenance position available. And I, I said, hey, I'll take anything. I said, but I can't fix anything. I'll just let you know I'm not handy. And they're like, oh, it's fine. There's a supervisor. He's actually a baseball fan. He'd love to work with you and help you and teach you. And so me and that guy went on and we, I took a maintenance job. And anything they asked me to do, it was like, pressure wash, stain, take out the trash, whatever it was, the mundane task, because I wasn't really good at the actual maintenance. I did it with a smile and I just worked hard at it. And eventually, you know, that they, they noticed that and they said, hey, you know, we've got another position available and it's a baseball outreach coordinator, a little more of a front office job. And you're going to, you know, help with camps and different things. And now I'm teaching again and I'm, I'm feeling that love of like coaching kids. And then ultimately that led to starting a team or two through them. And then my buddy and I, who were doing it together, took a leap of faith and, and jumped. And the Express, the name is Around Rock Express. Nolan Ryan and his family were amazing to us, but they had their own legacy. They had their own, you know, all that was them. And we're like, well, if we're going to do this and go all in. Let's let's create our own. And so we took a leap of faith and jumped out and started GPS Legends, like you mentioned. And and ever since then, it's been baseball 24-7 with High school youth uh, advocating for the kids with colleges and stuff like that is by far my favorite part of it, watching them go achieve their dreams. And uh, it's just been awesome. And again, it wasn't one of those things I could have looked forward and said, okay, all these things are going to happen. It was just humbly working hard in the moment. And then things just kept working out and being elevated from there. I want to talk about GPS Texas baseball. So GPS Texas baseball helps young men and shapes young men, not just on the field, but off the field. Yeah. So what is the high importance for you for teaching them not just baseball tools, but making sure they create the tools for their toolbox in a character aspect? Well, it's everything, honestly. And what we know here is baseball is going to end for every one of us, right? If you get a chance to play 15 years, we've got other guys in the organization that played 17, 18 years pro ball. I mean, just great men, great, great men. But every one of them realizes it's going to end at some point. And then you're going to be fathers, you're going to be husbands, and you're going to be all these things, right? And so how can we use this window of baseball where we have a little bit of influence in their life to create those habits, uh, both on and off the field? Uh, and again, my story is is wide open in our organization. I mean, it's let's talk about it. If you're having struggles, like here's what happened to me. Um, and, and then we just have so many great men that coach these young men within our program that we just know, we always say it's just bigger than baseball. I mean, yes, we, we're competitive. We want to win. We've had tons of guys going to play schools, had a few drafted. I mean, we're in this thing to get after it. It's high level baseball. But we also know that, hey, at the end of the day, all these lessons they're going to take away from this are is what's going to propel them in their next life, whatever that is. And if it's just a great high school players, awesome. They get to go play for a while, even better, but it's going to end. And now what have we done to leave an impact um, on their life throughout them coming through our program? That's our goal. I want to touch upon that character aspect. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this previously, but how do you and your colleagues, the people who help volunteer with this great organization, how do you 
teach, what are some of the tools you use to teach these men, those characters, and how do you kind of try to implement those tools they have in their toolbox that they can rely on? Well, that's a great question, Olivia. We do partner with some outside sources, you know, and usually it's folks, you know, we have a chief of police, his son plays in our organization. And so we set up social media awareness days, uh, fentanyl abuse day, you know, all these things that these guys are going through. Cause I mean, look, it's hard to be a teenager right now. And um, so sometimes we do that or service projects through, you know, feeding homeless or different things like that. Just kind of like character. Let's, let's look without, with, you know, outside of ourselves and it's not all about us. And as baseball players, man, whatever we think it is, but it's not. And so let's go do some of those things. And then within like the baseball aspect, it's just holding them to a high standard. Hold them accountable. Like for our program, when they get out of the car, they're in full uniform, tennis shoes. I mean, they're not in slip sandals and shorts and, and some people are, and that's okay. I mean, it's just us. It's, and, and the reason we do that is because in talking to scouts and evaluators and recruiters, and then the guys w- who have played at a high level in our organization, okay, what happens if you're really trying to achieve this goal and everything's the same, you're just as talented, everything's the same. They're going to have to find something that they're going to take you over that guy. And it might be your appearance. It might be how you ran on and off the field. It might be how you talked to your parents when they came to give you a Gatorade at the dugout and you didn't say thank you or yes, ma'am. You were like, whatever, get out of here. I've seen it all. I've noticed a while. I've seen scouts go, hey, I wrote that kid off because of X, Y, Z. So pouring all those things, taking all those lessons that we've seen that have cost other kids in some way, shape or form, and just holding to a high standard. It's not always easy. It's tedious and I'm always reminding them, it's not for us, guys. We don't care. Like, it's harder for us to get on you about all this stuff. But we're hoping that this will you know, give you a sense of, A, just a better opportunity to achieve your baseball dreams, but then some, some um, accountability in life and all the other things you're doing. And I think that's so important. Like you said, it's not just what's happening on the field, but, of course, dressing. And like you said, especially <laughs> when scouts come out or in life, right? You're applying for that job and you have the same qualifications as the person next to you. And everything is the same across the board. They have to find something to pick someone else over you. So whether that is in baseball, like you said, getting out of the car and looking game day ready all the time, looking put together, whether that's, you know, on your social media, being clean, you know, whatever it might be. And then in the working space, it can be something as, you know, what are you doing to continue to grow? And that could play back to baseball as well. What do you look for to continue to grow? What opportunities do you look for? What do you try to do, not just within the role, but that can set you apart in life? Absolutely. No, it's absolutely true. And, and not an hour ago, I'm on a chat with the coaches and some kid did a TikTok and it was a little, a little iffy. And, you know, one of our coaches put it on there. And so now we go and go, hey, you know, I know you just meant this in fun and, you know, but this could be looked upon negatively for scouts and stuff. Now they, they hopefully pull it down and they understand that we mean well. And so, yeah, well, it's always looking for opportunities to help them grow that way. How do you have that conversation? Kind of like you just said of the TikTok video in this case, when you have to teach a young man, especially teenagers, because teenagers can sometimes like to make their own decisions and not listen oh, yeah. to anyone. How do you have those conversations in a way that makes the other person open to hearing what you have to say? Well, I think it comes down to just, just being honest, just having hard conversations and, you know, um, the technique of, Hey, explaining why not just like, don't do this. Don't do that. Take your TikTok down. Da, 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 da. But like, Hey, do you understand why we're talking about this? You know, if it's no, sir, then it's like, well, here's why we had this other, um, situation where a young man wanted to go to the stream school and and this happened. And I just don't want to see anything happen like that to you. I want to give you the very best opportunity to achieve your dreams. And, and so that's part of that. And then ultimately they have to take that um, advice and go, okay, is this something I I, I want to choose to to believe and to, to make the behavioral changes? Or do I just feel like, eh, coach doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm a teenager. And for the most part, especially in our role, I mean, I think it's, it's harder to coach like high school sports because you kind of Whatever you get, that's who you get. For us, we can pick and choose if you're not a fit, you know, if you're a great player, but you're not a fit with the character stuff and and family and the whole thing, then, you know, maybe we're just not a fit and that's okay. 
but we just try to be very um, open with them, very straightforward. And then again, hopefully explaining the why behind it. Cause if we're just barking orders all the time and they don't know that we love and care about them and we really mean well, then I don't think it would be received very well. And I think that's important is you have to be open to hearing it and you have to ultimately make the decision of whether you want to hear what's being said to you. Take it as this is advice. This is where we're coming from. Or are you going to take that and say, you know, I'm not going to listen. And because at the end of the day and the theme throughout what we've been talking about today really is you have to make your own choices and you have to live with those choices. So are you going to be able to live with whatever decision you make? And if the answer is no, then don't make the decision. (laughs) Yes. And I, I, I wish it was that easy and it could be Mm -hmm. right. But I I was speaking last night and I said, if anyone would have came to me that night on September 13th and said, Hey, we're going to go out for some drinks and you're going to lose your family. And you're going to go to prison for four years. You're going to lose all your earnings. And you're, it's easy, right? Like, no, no, thanks. I'm good. But that's not how it comes packaged, right? It comes yeah. packaged as, eh, no big deal. Da, da, da. So I think that's where learning from others' mistakes mm-hmm. and being open and transparent about your shortcomings uh, becomes an asset for other people. And 100%. And that's part of the reason why I created this podcast is everyone has those shortcomings. And it is okay to have those shortcomings. Yeah. The important is kind of like I was saying is understanding what those shortcomings are, making the decisions of whether in the moment, you know, we're talking more extremes or not maybe something that's as pivotal in life as going to prison. But there are those small things where you can say, no, you know what, you know, whether it's picking college, yeah, that college might be good on paper, but I don't feel like I will fit in there. And, you know, when I went to college, for example, I was between two schools. And like you said, the road you choose ends up leading you down the road. And the one school gave me full ride and more. And the other school did not at all. (laughs) And I remember just that mindset of like, okay, I can go to this school. It's closer. It could potentially offer me these things. And I wrote a list. And then on the other hand, I walked on the other campus. It was farther, a lot farther away. I didn't necessarily know where that can lead. I just felt that feeling of, okay, I can see myself here. And I remember it was at Thanksgiving or Christmas time. And I was at my grandmother's house and I was talking to her about making this decision because also there was a lot of money on the line. And I go, well, one school's offering this and how can I turn that down? Now, mind you, the other school was by her and I'd gone in like every season. Anytime we went up there, I was at that school. And she said to me, if you go to the school you're talking about now, will you ever look back and say, what if I went to that other school? And if you go to that other school, will you ever look back and say, what if I went to school A? And I said, I have a feeling I might look back and say, what if I went to school B? I don't think I'll ever look back and say, what if I went to school A? And she goes, well, there's your decision. Some things aren't as simple as that. And I make the comment a lot recently is you can't always have rainy days or sunshine days, right? At the end of every, at the end of every point, there has to be a sun. Not every day is going to be sunny. So you have to know that you're going to get through it and there's going to be lessons learned along the way that make those sunshine days even better and make it more vivid and and make you feel more alive. And in those rainy days, you just have to keep telling yourself there's going to be that better tomorrow. Oh, that's awesome. And that's a great example, Olivia. And that plays out in my life as well because a big part of what we do for our, our high school athletes is advocate for their colleges. Mm-hmm. And it comes down to that big decision, right? And it's like, they want that answer. Like, it would be great if your grandma could say, it's that one. And it, I'm like, guys, there's not one. Like, there's a lot of good and make the list and do all the, you know, your your details. And, and um, but then at the end of the day, relying on your gut feeling, right? Like, did it feel like home? Could you see yourself there? And if baseball wasn't a part of it, there's a lot of other factors in your, mm-hmm. in your education and where you're going to spend your pivotal part of your college days, right? 
then I always like the simplest quote, and it's just so simple. And it's things work out best for those who make the best of the way things work out. So it's like you could go to either one of those and make it an outstanding experience and never look back, right? Instead of, or you could go to either one and go, oh, if I would have done that, and maybe I'm not in the right place. And in some places, you know, you end up not in the right place and you pivot, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, let's let's pick one, do our due diligence like you did, go with our gut, and then make the very best of that. And I just that's the way I. I do. And they always want me to give them the answer. Like, coach, which one is it? And I'm like, I can't make that for you. You've got to, I can get you in contact and then you've got to make the decision and and it's going to be you walking that out, not me. And that's sometimes the hardest part. Everyone at some point wants to just have the decision. Like someone Mm -hmm. just tell me what's going to be the right move. But at the end of the day, you're the only one who can make the decision for yourself. Brendan, how can people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you? Yeah, so my website is coachpuffpositive.com. That kind of takes you to everything. Um, Also, Coach Puff Positive without the E on Twitter. Um, But yeah, I think all the social media is on coachpuffpositive.com. And then, like I said earlier, from the bullpen to the state pen is on Amazon. So if anyone wants to take a peek at that, that's, that's where you find it. Thank you, Brandon Puffer, for all of your insight today. My pleasure, Olivia. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. I am so excited you were on and you gave some great takeaways. And a few of those key takeaways from today's conversation are don't bottle things up. It's so important to be able to speak about it and it can affect how you make decisions down the road. So it's better to not bottle them up and just get it out in the open as well as you can really be resilient in any situation. Sometimes you have to understand that you can be resilient. And in your lowest point, those resiliencies and decisions you make can change and alter how you see yourself, your own internal strength, but also what you can end up doing in the long run, as well as peace and joy can be found anywhere. And I think that's so important is no matter in the stage of life you are, or what's going on you can find your peace and joy. And it's just looking within and looking around you and saying, what brings me joy? What can I be doing? And no matter what's going on, do those small things. And ultimately it will build you up as well as explain the why. When you explain the why in the conversation, people end up being a lot more open to hearing you and understanding and then have a healthier conversation while that's happening because they're not just looking at it as they're trying to tell me what I should be doing, or this is just their opinion and they they don't actually know what's going on. When you explain the reason why you're bringing something to the table and the reasoning behind it, it gives the other person more of the opportunity to listen, to understand your point of view, and then take that and also feel comfortable enough to tell you their feelings and maybe why they're trying to make that decision and then it will allow you to also have that healthier conversation. This was a great episode with our top-notch guest, Brandon Puffer. Thank you for listening and have a successful day.